All right. If you have your Bibles with you then, we ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, and we're going to begin reading in verse 12. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, And as he, meaning Christ, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voice and said, Master, uh, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, shew yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and said with a loud voice, uh, said with a loud voice, glorified God, and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There, they are not found. That they, there are not found that return to give glory to God and to uh, save this stranger. And he said unto them, Arise, and he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. And when he demanded of the Pharisees, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word tonight, Lord, that we have it all in its entirety as it sits before us, God. Uh, we pray for people that no longer recognize this book is your word for the English-speaking people, Lord. They seem to be outnumbering us. But God, we pray that we would trust in this book that you use to make a living word and save our never-dying souls. God, tonight we pray that you would open your word to the hearts of believers. Lord, that you would uh, stir the hearts of the lost, that they might gain trust in you tonight. God, help us as a church together that we'd be ever mindful of you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture, and we're going to look exactly what happened uh, during this healing of the lepers. Exactly what it was and exactly what it wasn't. Uh, but before we get too deep into it, I, I want you to say this, that every one of us had a disease like unto leprosy, uh, a disease that consumed us, and that was sin. And if Christ don't intervene, uh, you'll be consumed by it. Uh, sin will eventually gain full control, and when you die, you will be left with nothing. And, and so I want you to see as we look at this, also look at it in the typology, that it is a condition of sin. Uh, verse 12 says, And he entered into a certain village. Now, a lot of people run over these uh, tales of Christ's ministry, but I want you to see many, many times he, uh, it says that he did certain things. Uh, and sir, and, and in fact, he, he met a certain woman there, speaking of a Samaritan woman. And here we find he uh, went into a specific village to accomplish a purpose. Right. Now, I want you to see that when the Lord saved you, he did the very same work in your life. He came to you specifically, <laughs> and he saved your soul, or dear friend, you probably not saved to begin with. And if it wasn't specific to you, then there is, uh, there is no salvation. And remember, uh, I believe it's uh, James says, make your calling and election sure, and so part of that is the calling, and the calling is specific. So he went into a certain specific village. And he came and, uh, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers. Now, I want you to see that le leprosy, even though it is non-painful, it was, it was a dreaded disease. Because it killed people, right? Uh, you didn't, you didn't recover. A lot of people don't realize leprosy is still around today, very much so. It's, it's not been taken care of. It's not. There's still leper colonies. 
And uh, so people are disbanded because of leprosy. And listen, whenever, when you were born without Christ, you were disbanded from God's people. When Adam fell in the dark and caved into his bossy wife Eve, let me tell you, it separated every one of us uh, that belonged to God. Now let me say this, something we don't always think of, the other bunch were already separated. Uh, they would never be us to start with. But it impacted us that belonged to him and, and made a gap that we could not fulfill. And so this leprosy, this spiritual leprosy is born to every one of us. And, uh, and the only remedy is an experience with Christ. And, and so we find here that the, uh, the lepers, there were ten of them. Uh, ten people that was sent. Uh, now, I want you also to see that they were exactly where they were supposed to be. Now, in, in, in two different ways. First of all, lepers not allowed in the city. They were always outside the gate. And they could not go in because of the fear of sp uh, spreading leprosy. Now, second, I want you to see they were at the very point, the very site the very instant where they would meet Christ. Isn't it a wonderful thing when you think about all the millions upon millions, little, little things that had to happen to put you in the right place at the right time to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, isn't it a wonderful thing uh, when, when we begin to think the, of the complexity of things that he put you in the right spot at the right time and to come and say, hey, you're mine. That, that, that's a marvel to me when I begin to think of how good he's been uh, just to accomplish that. And so I want you to see, in addition to being in the leper spot, they were exactly where Christ would have had them to be. And he entered the city. And they, meaning the lepers, lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master. Now, I want you to see, uh, don't let that impress you none. Because they didn't mean like, Master, you're our leader. Or they didn't mean like, Master, I'm your servant. All they meant is you're a good teacher, like a master's degree. Like someone that had been well educated. That's all they were saying. See, they didn't understand him for who he was. And you know today why the doctrines of grace are so irritating to people and they want to call us names? It's because they don't understand who Christ is. Right. Their Christ is wringing their, his hands hoping just maybe you'll give him a little time of the day. You know what? Whenever I come to face eternity, I don't want a Christ like that, do you? I want a Christ that's sovereign. I want a Christ that says, He's mine. I gave my life for him. Enter ye in unto the glories of the Lord. That's the type of Christ I want. The one that has victory over sin, not waiting and hoping for me to do something. So I want you to see when Christ comes in, they didn't know who he was. They had no idea. They called him by his name. But they didn't know what his office was. You know, a lot of people today, hey, we live in the South. There's very, very few people that you will find, even if they stand in opposition to him, there's very few people that cannot name the name of Jesus. But see, the thing is, is they don't know who he is. Uh, they know about him, but they don't know him. And, and that's what I would be uh, sure of tonight. And, and I frequently do this myself. I want to be sure that I know, that I know, that I know the Lord Jesus Christ intimately. I want to be, I want to be certain that, that he is the, the very center of everything that I do. That's, that's the relationship that I, that I would want with Christ. And so when they said this, they... They really didn't understand Christ. Now know what the request is. Have mercy on us. Now, you can say, well, that's very respectful. No, 
I don't necessarily really think so. I think, I'm, I think they were thinking of themselves. See, because if they could be healed from the leprosy, they didn't have to die. And if they could be healed from the leprosy, they could reunion with Israel and be inside the city again. I think it was a very self-preserving -preser type of idea. It was carnal. Now, when we began to preach the gospel and pe point people unto Christ, you know what? You be very careful how you do that. And don't you start this mess of you don't want to go to hell, do you? You know what? You're not pointing people to Christ when you do that. All you're pointing them is, hey, if you want it, it's yours, right? And, and there's no truth in that. And, and so we find then the Lord Jesus Christ, when they approach him and they say, Master, uh, they really don't know what they're saying. They lifted up their voices, pure plural, so I'm assuming they all said, help us, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, uh, that he saw them. He understood the problem. He looked upon all ten of them, and he saw their need. Isn't it a wonderful, blessed thing tonight that one day he looked down from his lofty home on high, sitting there by God the Father, and looked down and, and saw a useless piece of garbage, black and ungodly with sin, and said, Hey, huh, guess what? You're mine. You, you belong to me forever. And he saved my soul. See, that's not what they were experiencing. All they were experiencing was a cleansing of the flesh. And I, I dare say today, that's mostly what people get when they think they're being saved. You know, a guilty conscience can make you do a lot of things. Have you ever thought about that? Just a simple guilty conscience, uh, knowing that you've been sinful, doesn't doesn't really mean that you're that you're convicted of your sin. You see what I'm saying? I mean, before the Lord saved me, I knew I was getting into some pretty ungodly stuff. But I'd never been convinced by the Word of God and convinced more importantly by the Holy Ghost. Hey, I'm in that number. And, and so we find today in a lot of supposed gospel churches that that element is missing. And it comes down to no, nothing more than making a positive decision for yourself. You know, today, uh, uh, I'm amazed today at how many so-called churches are letting the sodomites in and saying, hey, that's okay. Don't you worry about that. And listen, uh, if this Jezebel that the, the Democratic Party has has enticed to be with them, if she wins, you better look out. She said in her acceptance speech today to the Democratic Party, one of her main things is to take our guns. Yeah. And you know what? That'll just be the beginning of what she takes. Mm -hmm. and, and so we see, but you know what? I really believe God will hold that back. I've prayed a lot about it, and I, and I believe he'll hold, he'll hold it for a time. Now, Church, the, the instance will come, and, and you better have you better be sure you you're lined up because I believe the instance is coming. But I'll give I believe he'll give us a little another four year reprieve. But in the meantime, hopefully those four years we will we will use very wisely uh, for the things of God. So uh, he uh, they approach him for mercy. He sees them, and he said unto them, Go, go, shew yourselves unto the priest. Now, I want you to see that he kind of does two, uh, two things. Number one, he kind of puts it back in their lap. Now, going did not mean going unto Christ. 
He was reminding him that they were still under the law. And, and you remember how they what, what they had to do? They had to always go by the priest and he would inspect their skin and do an assessment and say, oh no, there's one. You got to go outside the field again. You, you, you have to leave, you have to leave Jerusalem. You have to leave this town. You still have a spot. So in one sense, he was still validating the law because, see, the age of grace was a few days coming. And he was saying, yeah, you still need to honor the law. You still need to do this and acknowledge what the law is, is still about. And he gave them uh, that. And being good, sound Jews, they took it. Now, personally believe, believe there were nine good Jews and one half-breed. You know what you are? If you're saved tonight, you're a half-breed. <laughs> you have a saved eternal soul and a wretched, ungodly flesh. You're just as much as a half-breed as any Samaritan that ever lived. Mm -hmm. and, and so we find then that uh, these men were running toward the temple and have you ever thought except for obedience what did they expect because he never tells them I'm going to heal you he never tells them I'm going to conquer this disease in simply what I think and, you know a lot of those things he, he just spoke it into being. Peace, be still. And the storm quit raging. <laughs> Lazarus came forth and the dead came back to life. And all he said, he never said, leprosy go. He never said, just believe on me. All he said, go show yourself to the priest. You do what the law tells you to do. You go be inspected again. So you know what we need what we need tonight. Like you and you know how it is. I ain't the only one in the building like this. How cold and indifferent you get to the things of God, just ju just that that quick. You know, you know what you need. You need an inspection. You you need to find where the problem lies, what the issue is, and see uh, our God is faithful to do that. He, he will show you that. But now the problem is this, is we don't always address it once he shows us. Once he's very specific about the sin in our life, instead of acknowledging it and getting it right with the Lord, we actually are booed up and boasted in it. And the Lord is not pleased. So they get some instruction without any guarantee of healing. And it came to pass that as they went, so they were being obedient, they were listened, they were cleansed. Now, I want you to see they're, they're going along, and I've often wondered how advanced their leprosy was. Were they already missing fingers and toes? Did they already have big splotches on them that had just fallen off in their arms and their legs? I don't really know how, how bad it had gone, but as they were going up there doing what they were supposed to be doing, maybe some fingers pop, popped back into place. Maybe from going from that lily white, they began seeing the, dark, the darker tone like most Jews have. They, they began to understand and know that they were healed. Now, it's a wonderful thing to be healed, is it not? Mm -hmm. But it's a sad, sad thing to know, not know how you got healed. See, uh, I don't know uh, uh, how many of you faced illness in your life, but I can tell you this, the way that you got healed is the person of Christ. The way that that was accomplished wasn't the skilled hand of a surgeon. It was the mercy of a mighty God. And he did it. 
He accomplished it. Why? For his own glory and his own honor. You know, every time I get an opportunity to tell somebody what the Lord has done for me health-wise, I tell them, and uh, Brother Eric and I was talking about uh, the things along this line the other day, and he said, well, I'm sure glad I'm not a preacher. And I said, well, why do you say that? He says, they have some of the worst lives I've ever seen. Uh, he says, every day it seems like you've got a new health problem. And you know what? That's, that's true. It's, I, I, sometimes I think myself, what's going to be next? But you know, every opportunity, just like tonight saying, hey, this old right kidney is doing a little bit more again. I give him praise and glory and honor. Yeah. So he has purpose in what he does. And he had purpose in healing these ten men. He had purpose in doing exactly what he wanted to. And I want you to see that he had dominion over illness. Every situation, now he's not going to heal everybody. First of all, death will accomplish its purpose because even old Lazarus, you know what? He's still not sticking around today. I don't know when Lazarus and Martha and Mary finally died, but I do know they're not living today. See, death claimed him once again, and this time it kept him. Uh, and you're going to die somehow too. From the oldest one that's in here to the youngest, you listen to me, death is a reality. Today, uh, I sent a patient to the, uh, to the hospital from the nursing home that I would say she's probably already dead even as we speak. Uh, she's out of eternity. And you know what? You will be too one day. Have you ever ever thought about yourself and I, I, I thought about uh, myself in this situation because it's so easy to talk about death when you've seen it as many times as I have. But what if it's somebody dear to you? What if it's your mama? What if it's one of your babies? I remember when Judy died, mama kept saying, I never thought I'd bury one of mine. I never thought I would bury one of mine. And you know what? I think that's a fair thought. I don't think I ever will either, but the truth is, is I just don't know. You see what I'm saying? Death is easy to think about until it's coming your way. And so we find then that with dominion over disease that our Lord can stop anything that he wishes to at any time that he wishes to. Now verse 15 and one of them. And one of them. One individual out of ten. Now let's see. Tonight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Counting the babies, there's eleven in the house tonight. Now, can you imagine just one coming back and saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord? You know what? Every one of us tonight ought to be able to sing his praises and say, you know what? This is what the Lord has done for me. Listen, if you're healthy as a horse, listen, I know one condition you had. If you're saved, you were dying and on your way to hell and very much deserving it, and Christ intervened. That is something every one of us could praise him for. And you know what? For the rest of the night, not just to 8 o'clock when service time's over, but just keep praising him and keep praising him. You see, if we got into a service like that, people would think we're crazy. But you know what? We can praise him that long. And so we find out of the average 10, there's just one, just one that has an inclination to praise the Lord. That's, that's kind of sad. You think about it like this. Even those of us that are redeemed, maybe one instance out of ten. Like, uh, you know, most days come to church, oh, I don't want people to think I'm crazy. I don't want people to think I'm foolish. And then finally one day, you get so full of the goodness of God and you remember all the things that he's done for you 
before you across time and you get so excited that you have to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me tell you what he's done for me this week. About one out of ten services. See, um, I want more than that, don't you? Ever wonder why you don't get more out of the services than you do? It's because of what you put in for. I fully believe that. Men, ladies, all of us, it's what we put into it. It's what it is exactly what we're going to get out of it. And you know what? I'd love to put 110% into it tonight and be able to praise my Lord. One of them, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. Now, a couple of things this is a good indication of. Number one, the one that got the real deal was leaving the law and going back unto Christ. One out of ten. And then he he turns around, and I want you to see that he recognizes that he's healed. You know, it doesn't say that about the other nine, does it? So maybe they didn't recognize it. Maybe they were too spiritually stupid. Now, I believe that, the, as I understand this excerpt right, they all were healed, and, and, but we find only one recognizes the miracle of it. You know, that's the problem today with reducing salvation to nothing more than agreeing to a set of facts. It gives God no glory at all. It, it puts it in a situation probably like these other lepers took their healing. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Now, I would love to know what this young man said. I would love to know what his verbiage was, what, what the words was that he said on this occasion, because for, for several, several years now, Jared and I have been trying to get our minds around what is glorifying and what is praising to God. But like some of those other things in the Word of God, he just tells us it happened. I don't know if he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know that he, <laughs> instead of saying Jesus Master, maybe he said Jesus Lord. Maybe he began to understand that Christ's dominion is even with God's. I don't know exactly what he said, but whatever those words that came out of his mouth was very, very much in a way that praised God for who he was. Praise the Lord in the way that it should be done. Notice verse 16. And he fell down on his face at his feet. Now we get a little bit more detail here of exactly what's going on. And he does this. Now, how many times have you seen that in a Baptist church? Cut me out of the equation and see who's left. Right? Well, why is it any different today? Just falling prostrate. You know, if I understand effective prayer, every time effective prayer was accomplished, that's how it was done. You know where this comes from? The Catholic Church. That's where it comes from. You'll even see their little figurines doing that in their churches. There, there, there's no Bible for that at all. And, and so we find then that this, this young man, all he knows to do is to shout the Lord's praises and fall out prostrate before the man, before the being, before the person that saved him and fell on his feet, face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. I like, uh, I like that, giving thanks. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole again. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for raising me up in a place where I could hear the gospel. 
Thank you uh, for the breath of life. Thank, listen, I've had plenty to eat today. Thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, today, me and Donna celebrating 32 years of marriage. And you know what? I still love her even more than the day that I said I do. And you know what? It is your rarity today. That, that's not a very common thing. So you know what I can do? I can give the Lord the praise for it because it's not Donna and it's not me. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we can, we can praise Him. Anything you can imagine and recognize in your life, you can praise God for it. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that we ought to be likened to the little half-breed Jew, the Samaritan, that knew how to praise God. And so he just laid at His feet. In verse 17. And Jesus answering and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where is the nine? Now, I ask you tonight the very same question, where is the nine? You know, sometimes, listen, we, we all family tonight. Uh, uh, and uh, Jared's family, some of them's not here. You know, he knew where the nine was. See, an omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing God, he knew where the nine was. He just wanted that little boy to know where the nine is. Now, I ask you this. Nine, see, I, I, I can still remember math. <laughs> nine out of 10 is 90%. Right? Help me out, Jerry. And, uh, you know, that means probably 90% of the time we're not doing what we ought to be doing. And, and so he asked this question, where are they not? And, and you know what? The, the answer to this question physically is they did not know. I often wonder, did they ever make it to the priest? Did they ever make it down to the temple? And truth being told, since the word doesn't say, we don't know. A lot of people that preach this say that they may they, they were at the temple. Well, they're reading into this, are they not? I don't know if they did it or not. Sometimes I wonder. Verse 18. They are not found. They are not found that return to give glory. To God save this stranger. I want you to see that uh, it was recognizable that they didn't give glory to God. And it's recognizable when we don't give glory to God in any way that this feeble flesh could offer it. Being in accord accordance to what the Bible teaches us about serving. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Amen. Uh, I would that women, I want to quote this correctly, that they, uh, that they dress as women professing godliness. As women. I would, I would that they dress as women. In the American culture, at least for a little bit, there's one garment. If you don't believe that, the next time you're out in the public and you're trying to trick, pick out the bathroom, look at the picture and not the words. And you know what? You're still going to come to the same conclusion. Yeah. Right? And so we see then, in every little minuscule way, we ought to give God the praise. We ought to lift Him up. We ought to give Him great glory and honor in everything that we can think of and, and, be, uh, and be a vessel of praise rather than a vessel that is of no use. Arise. Uh, and He said unto them, Arise unto Him. Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Now, I think it's very interesting 
that he says, go thy way. Now, I don't know about you, but I've made some pretty dumb decisions since I've been saved. And I'd be willing to bet you have too. Right? Yeah. So going <laughs> my way don't always work out. But see, when I'm in the perfect will of God and not the permissive will of God, when, when I go my way, it's good because it's God's way. Now, when I allow sin in my life and I'm running around like a sinner, and you know, don't tell me that God's in that because he's not. And then, uh, you know, I've heard people almost brag about going to the school of hard knocks. Well, listen, the problem with being in the school of hard knocks is this. One day you've got to graduate. Mm. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so we find there, as the Lord's people, it ought to be our great and wonderful desire to be as the Samaritan, to be as this stranger. And really, this is what I think. It, it, it comes down to this. this. This was the example of the Gentile when compared to the Jew. You know, uh, this thing, modern thing of Messianic Jews, and even people just becoming Jewish, uh, that's the 90%. People, only about 10% see the efficacy of Christ. To see that he's sufficient, to see that I don't need anything else, don't need, don't, no, don't need to be baptized, I don't need to be, uh, uh, don't have to be a member of the church. All I need is Christ, he's my all in all. What more could you have?